Yeah, today we saw the, uh, the defence present their arguments as to why they should be allowed to appeal. Um, and they covered um, the major things at issue in this case. Previously at the High Court, we, we've only been looking at the arguments about Julian's health and the conditions in American jails. Was today we actually got into the substance of, of the case. We got into uh, issues of free speech. We got into discussion of the major crimes of the uh, United States uh, armed forces uh, uh, and the fact that WikiLeaks exposed major criminal activity by the state uh, uh, that was stated in, in terms it's rather lovely to hear that in court you, you don't expect to hear mm -hmm. that said in such an official um, session um, uh, 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 and we got into the questions of whether or not Julian can expect a fair trial at all in the in, in, in the United States uh, uh, and also the whole question of freedom of speech uh, the right to know of the public, of things done in the names by government, um, and uh, even questions of whether or not he might potentially face a, a death penalty, or, or whether the United States government may, having got him to the United States, add new charges or, or develop the, the, the accusations against him. Um, so it really was a, a very full and interesting day. And, and I would say as a scene setter that this is the first day in many, many days of hearings on the Assange case at different levels. This was the first day I have ever come out of a court feeling that the court behaved in a reasonably fair manner, that they were not hostile or, or aggressive, but that questions the judges asked were reasonable, uh, framed reasonably, um, and that there was no sign of aggressive intent towards the towards the defence. So, um, uh, today felt like you were actually in a courtroom and, and at no stage in the Assange process has that really felt like that before. Yes, that's a very interesting point. I know I came out of the courtroom today when the uh, court hearing had concluded and I felt that the defence made a very strong case. I agree with you as well that it was uh, quite extraordinary to be able to hear the significance and the impact that WikiLeaks publications had in foreign courtrooms as well. So that was a very important, important that that was addressed. I see some of you over here nodding you, Emmy, in particular. Uh, what is your response to some of the, the points raised well, here? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, we, uh, I was outside the court um, throughout the day, uh, wasn't able to go inside. So it's very interesting. I wanted to ask, did the uh, U.S. government have a say today at court at all? No, they, they didn't. It was completely on completely the... Completely defence. The right. U.S. government will present its case tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. tomorrow. yeah, well, this, it is promising, but of course, uh, throughout uh, the court hearings, we've had this adversarial uh, relationship between... Um, how the courts handled both journalists, members of the public, and of course the defence team. We've had that continuously. So it's um, hopeful to hear that uh, they behaved in a half-decent way. Of course we've read in publications, especially to Classified UK, that both judges are um, very deeply entrenched within the British establishment, and uh, one makes one very doubtful of the outcome. Uh, but it is a, an opportunity for the defence team to put across all the important points and extremely important for the historic record, which will revisit this case, being a very historic case, that as much as information is put out in the public record and especially in the court records, and so I'm glad to hear that it was allowed to be so. So thank you for being there and uh, letting us know. Yes, this I think was the first time that the defense was able to address their points on appeal before a court, especially the points in which the judge, the magistrate judge, ruled in favor of the uh, prosecution in that initial ruling. Chris, you were present in the courtroom. Any uh, general thoughts or impressions today? Yes, I would caution against being too sanguine about the attitude of the judges, although of course Craig is right. Uh, I sat, I covered the uh, trial of Chelsea Manning, and the judge was not only uh, 
uh, respectful, but I would even at certain points describe as motherly and then knife to Chelsea in the back. So um, th the demeanor is interesting, um, but it, it may not be significant. I, I think we do have to remember that in the afternoon they kept hammering the defense about uh, the, uh, the failure to adequately redact and put people's lives in danger. This is the canard that the U.S. uses as a big bludgeon to go after Julian, although, of course, even they have had to admit that they have no evidence that anybody was actually armed. Uh, but they asked that question several times. I think the, uh, the most interesting aspect for me, again, occurred in the afternoon, and that, I think, was the correct focus by the defense on Vault 7, because he's not charged. Vault 7 was the uh, leaking uh, what was it, 2017, Craig? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. To the leaking of the CIA hacking tools, the, their ability to uh, uh, use our smartphones, even our cars, internet, TV, anything, even when they're off, to mm -hmm. monitor us. Um, and that really triggered the fiercest animus against Julian. That's when Mike Pompeo, shortly after that, he was then the head of the CIA and the Trump administration, attacked uh, WikiLeaks and Julian is what non-hostile, non-state intelligence agencies, I may have that slightly garbled, uh, and then you really saw an acceleration towards the extradition, which the Obama administration had not pushed for, what they call the New York Times problem, because of course what Julian and WikiLeaks did was no different from what The Guardian, El Pais, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, all did in terms of publishing. They published this in a kind of joint project. Um, and and I think that was an important point because although he's, he's not charged for the release of the publication of the information in Vault 7, it's very clear that the engine of the extradition, the forces that are pushing for his extradition, come out of the CIA and that um, if he is extradited and ends up in the Eastern District Court of uh, Virginia, which is a kind of bastion of CIA it's very close to the CIA, and the jury pool is all pulled from uh, people who have relatives, friends, uh, you know, connections to the CIA and other national security agencies that are all headquartered in that area. And that's why the government wants it there, because they win those cases. I don't see, and, you know, I'll see what Joe and others think, Craig, I don't see how they're not going to hit him with these charges. And potentially, I mean, at that point, and I, th I think that the defense was correct in raising uh, not only would these charges exacerbate the he's facing 175 years already, um, but then it, it really becomes, uh, you know, the, the potential of even the death penalty becomes possible. So that was, I thought, the most interesting aspect that I, I saw this afternoon, yeah. And of course they gave... Uh uh, the um, alleged whistleblower uh, 40, shorter, 40, 40 years. years. Yeah, for, what? 40 years, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. that's right, and also uh, the, uh, one of the expert witnesses, Maureen Baird, she did point out uh, after a question uh, on re-examination by Mark Summers in the extradition hearing that it is the CIA that if they, you know, if the charges are not aggregated to death penalty, they can make it as actually worse um, than death by imposing saps any time they like. And I think Mark, Mark Summers really pointed that out today. And we should explain what SAMs are. So Special administrative right. measures. And I've watched them at work yes. because they were used after 9-11 when the American government at the behest of the Israelis shut down all of the Palestinian activists and all of the major Palestinian organizations like the Holy Land Foundation, these people are still sitting in jail. So I covered the case of Fahad Hashmi, and he was put in isolation in uh, the MCU in New York for 23 months. <clears throat> and now Fahad had, his crime was that he was smart and articulate and had been a leader of the Palestinian movement. At his trial, they actually played surreptitious tapes or recordings that they had of him speaking about Palestine at the university to convict him. Um, he was uh, doing a graduate degree, I think, at the University of London, London School of Economics, and his roommate had sent waterproof socks, I didn't even know such things existed, to the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or something, and had borrowed his cell phone. I mean, it was just really flimsy. 
But the point is, when they brought him into court, he was a zombie. He he didn't know where he was. He yeah. they had broken him, um, and they know how to break you scientifically. And of course, they're applying these psychological measure torture to Julia. Uh, and and so these Sams are very pernicious. They isolate you. They uh, restrict your ability to see the quote-unquote evidence used against you. Even your lawyers can't see it. Uh, it. It's extremely difficult for you even to have contact with family members. Um, it's it's complete social isolation. But just to throw that out, that you know, in the diplomatic note, which has no legal validity really, mm. they said they won't impose Sam's on Julian. This is part of the assurances. Uh, they won't impose Sam's on Julian. Unless, of course, he warrants them, so they can. But it's important that we have other SAM-like measures, MCUs, management control units, that really replicate. I mean, one of the things they said in the diplomatic notice, he won't go to uh, Florence, Colorado, this high-tech supermax prison, mm -hmm. pre-trial, without saying that nobody goes to, nobody goes to Florence yes, pre-trial. Right. So it's really cynical. Um, but they have lots of ways to break you. I, and I also teach in the prison system and have for 14 years through Rutgers University and the College of so I kind of see it up close. Mm -hmm. And even there, on a smaller scale, they'll pull my students for minor, like having a cell phone, which was sold to them by the guard, of course, and throwing them in for a year, and they come out. Or they say after six days, they start to lose it. But having taught students that come out, even after a year in isolation, they're, they're, they, they don't ever fully recover. So, um, it's, it's important to know that they have all sorts of mechanisms within the bureaus of prison that are designed to destroy you. It's, it's routine within yes. the American prison system. And what they do is they break you and then they drug you. So mm -hmm. what they want to do is break you in isolation and then give you psychotropic drugs where you're basically a zombie and you go down the hall to the mess hall shaking. This is routine within the American prison system, but it's especially used for high profile cases as it was for these Palestinians, as it was for Fahd Ashmi, and as it will be for Julian if he is extradited. Well, it was very interesting that they, the judges who didn't seem to know all that much about what had happened in the past we're asking questions about the assurances. And do we have this, these assurances here? They wanted to read them. But one question they asked is if there was an assurance that would um, assure against Julian's charges being aggregated to a capital offense in the United States. And of course there aren't. Yeah. So for everybody listening right now, I just want to uh, give some additional background information. Uh, initially, it was stated that Mr. Assange would be subjected to SAMs or special administrative measures. Chris outlined what that is uh, very clearly. This is beyond solitary confinement. Now, of course, uh, later on during the extradition proceedings, the United States uh, then came forward and uh, provided a so-called assurance that he would not be subjected to SAMs or special administrative measures, but we do know, of course, there's a loophole um, with this particular assurance and all of them, in fact, which allows for them to be overturned basically at, at any moment. And another point just to make clear for the listeners again, that once Julian Assange is on U.S. soil, if he is extradited, again, still unclear at this point, and we would all uh, hope for that, certainly not to be the case, and those who do in fact care about press freedom, if extradited, additional charges could be brought forth which would make him eligible for the death penalty. And that was also another point that was addressed in court today by the defense. Before I hand it over to Joe, because I would like you to, to weigh in as well on this point if you would like, I do want to welcome our another Fidel. guest uh, joining us, Fidel Narvaez former employee of the Ecuadorian Embassy. It's great to have you with us. Um, I'll get to you in one second. First, I'll hand it over to Joe for a few comments. Yeah, I'd like to set the scene. Uh, this court tried to limit the amount of coverage. Yeah. That they, is true. In previous cases, uh, in the extradition hearing in 2020, and in the high court hearing, in 2021, October, you could be anywhere in the world if you were a legitimate journalist, you can get a link to watch it. This, for some reason, they have limited it to people that you had to be on English or Welsh territory. No explanation for this, why this is different now and then. Before, and then we went into the courtroom, 
Uh, it's a quite a beautiful uh, courtroom. Uh, uh, very small, however. About, I counted seven rows of about 15 people across. And against this, I think, walnut wooden paneled walls and bookshelves with law books is an iron cage on the top left that was empty because Julian decided, what we learned from the court, confirmed by his lawyers, that he decided not to come today. He could have come. He also didn't want to watch it on video link. The story was that he was ill. So you can imagine what he's going through and he wouldn't want to necessarily watch this travesty anymore. However, he may have been encouraged, and not overly, as Chris is pointing out, uh, by this incredibly strong presentation by his lawyers uh, left me uh, feeling, uh, and I tried to resist this feeling of some high expectation. How could they lose this case when you hear this argument? There's just no way if there's going to be any kind of semblance of justice here. And what I particularly liked was the simple way they laid out a timeline to show what the U.S. motives were here. And that there's no difference between any authoritarian state crushing a journalist who is reporting and revealing their crimes at that the United States do. And I think this is a hurdle for Western uh, leaders, for the public, because we're continuously thinking that only other countries have this type of behavior by their leaders. We're not capable of that. We're the good guys. Uh, it's all the others that do that. And I think that's a huge hurdle to get overcome. But today we heard the U.S. and their war crimes, Julian Exposing that is why they clearly went after him, and we saw that Vault 7, yes, was an important milestone in this because that got Pompeo after him, and he is the driving force behind this prosecution, and uh, it's horrible, horrible what we saw. We also saw a lot of good arguments about the difference between the Extradition Act and the Extradition Treaty, because the Extradition Treaty between the U.S. and U.K. says there, can no be, uh, there cannot be an extradition for political offenses. That was left out of the act, the implementing act in Parliament. But as his lawyer's argument, that didn't mean that they didn't um, in some way refer to it. And in fact, there is a referral, you correct me if I'm wrong, but correct that uh, you cannot extract someone if you violate their uh, on ethnic or religious or political opinions is another reason you cannot extradite someone. So even the act does prevent a political opinion. And they went to great lengths to show what that he had a political opinion, and espionage being a supremely uh, <laughs> political crime, and that there are studies and many authorities say this, not just, it's not just colloquially thought of. So all in all, it was uh, an encouraging day. But again, I don't think one should be carried away with this, because we're not dealing with a uh, necessarily level playing field here. I say back to the diplomatic uh, assurances of it. I thought it was remarkable that in a court of law, um, a political instrument like diplomatic assurances is given uh, deference. Because uh, uh, we had the Home Office uh, Minister uh, referring to the court's opinion, and then we had the whole, the whole court referring to and accepting diplomatic assurances, which is a political instrument. This is just a very highlights to me that it is a very much a, a political case, mm -hmm. which they're trying to uh, make an appearance of uh, legality or legal process or court process. But they adhere and remain faithful to the political objectives that this uh, particular prosecution is uh, trying to achieve, which is of course limiting free speech, uh, diminishing the First Amendment and putting the fear of God in every truth-telling journalist and publisher around the world. I just want to add that the judges are senior judges. Um, as we were discussing on the way over here, there's really no promotions they can get, which is a good thing. So it would be hard to pressure them as they did with the magistrate in this case, who was a young judge and got a promotion after that case was over. So I think uh, they showed some that they were intrigued by this case. They clearly had had a lot of knowledge. You could tell by the way they were reacting. They didn't really know this case at all. Um, so I think that's something encouraging. That they got, they were intrigued by this, and particularly when there was a discussion about the fact that he would not have First Amendment rights, not being abroad, but it, when he's on U.S. soil. I think they seemed to be taken aback by that. I thought, well, they found that to be. Uh, 
something that they should find out more about. You know, I think they were a little troubled, maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But uh, Let me just ask them, and I may be wrong, you can correct me, but it's my understanding that we don't know that, that they have talked, uh, it was a Pompeo, I think, who said that he would not have First Amendment rights. And Cromberg. Cromberg. It was Cromberg, the judge Cromberg. But it's not, we don't know for sure, uh, do we? Cromberg said he, he could raise that argument. He could. And, and, and Pompeo, Pompeo said and it Pompeo. more directly, he will not have Right, the Pompeo did. But, but there's, there's, there's actually no legislation that says that he should have First Amendment right. rights. So, the que so the ab there's an absence there, this right, point. Right, but, but I'd always interpreted that as still open or not. Do you think that it's a fait accompli that if he is extradited, he will not be granted First Amendment rights? I well, think when it comes to the Espionage Act, uh, if, that, if that's challenged, that this is a conflict with the First Amendment, since he's acting as a journalist here, I think that might be when they decide, hmm, Kronberg may say, I think I'll argue that he doesn't have First Amendment rights. So it becomes a critical yes. issue in case. Uh, just to provide some um, background here, we heard a little bit in court today about uh, this particular issue where Mr. Assange may not be afforded First Amendment rights to free speech and that of the free press, even if on U.S. soil. Uh, the reasoning behind that potentially is because he is an Australian citizen, not a U.S. citizen, so he would not be granted these rights. However, he is subjected to the U.S. Espionage Act, so just uh, some background information there. Uh, any other well, I, thoughts I, I, on I'd just like to say that uh, Mark Sumner's point was that there's nothing really written in stone about what happens to foreign right. nationals, mm -hmm. right? So, in fact, Pompeo and Attorney Assistant Attorney General uh, Gordon Cromberg both have threatened to say that he doesn't have any rights, and so. Uh, Summer's point was that, that the UK cannot expose uh, somebody to the risk that they will not be protected under the First Amendment. Well, and we should be clear that all of the uh, detainees in Guantanamo did not have First Amendment rights. Yes. But this is Europe. I mean, under the European Convention of Human Rights, I mean, it, there has to be an equivalence with Article 10, right? They weren't on US soil, though. In Guantanamo, well, technically. technically. I mean, yeah, that's why they One put reason them they're there. Exactly. Right, and they, exactly. they, they actually legally classified it as, I forget the term, it was kind of Orwellian, no place or something like that, that it didn't have any, nobody had any jurisdiction because it was outside of all legal jurisdiction. But that might tell you that they were afraid that if they bring him inside the U.S. that he would, could successfully argue that he had this right, if other, all the rights of the Constitution. And this really gets into the persecution of Julian Assange, the um, the lack of rights that he has. And Videl, I know that you have uh, worked in the embassy. You have seen him be subjected to uh, very poor conditions, and that's putting it quite lightly. Would you like to, to weigh in with your thoughts? Here we are uh, several years later since the start of the extradition proceedings, but you have, have been yeah. involved with this ca case for quite some time. So why don't you just uh, give us your thoughts? Yes, sure, sure. I uh, apologize for uh, joining a bit uh, later than he was supposed to. Anyway, before I go to that, I just want to comment a few things on, on what is was said here. It struck me that the judges didn't know much about these diplomatic assurances, because that's the very reason we are having this now. Exactly. That's why the courts reverted the original decision not to extradite him, yeah. the, 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 the diplomatic assurances. Um, they are called diplomatic because they come through the, the State Department, FCO, but they are signed by the uh, prosecutor. Yeah, that's why they call diplomatic. It's the prosecutor issue, issuing it, uh, that. Um, I was hoping uh, for the lawyers to mention when they talk about Vault 7 to, make, to mention the current situation of the Vault 7 whistleblower okay. who is subjected to SAMS Special yeah. Admin Administrative Measures and who is struggling struggling there yeah that was not, 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 not mentioned I was hoping to the other thing that uh, I hope it could be mentioned is that 
the CIA has practically admitted that he was spying on the embassy. And this comes as a result of the uh, uh, lawsuit taking place in the United States by these two uh, journalists and two lawyers and all of that. Yes. The CIA is, is, is uh, saying that uh, this is somehow state secret. <laughs> state secret? <laughs> That's an admission that they, are, they were doing something that they don't want to disclose. Yeah? And I heard yesterday an interview by BBC Four to Stella. She, she did wonderfully, and she talked about Pompeo. I assume that was recorded interview because immediately after her, the journalist quoted Pompeo saying, this is pure fiction, pure fiction. This journalist should be writing fiction or something. But there are some contradictions in there because in other occasions, he has practically admitted. Absolutely. And something that I expect the lawyers could also bring into the court is that this matches perfectly and then we go to the embassy and the spying on UC Global that they, we know, because it's the case in, in Spain against UC Global, we know by the testimony of the whistleblowers and by the documents that are being disclosed on the investigation mm -hmm. that they were plans to poison Julian Assange or to leave the doors open in order for him to be kidnapped. Mm. And we know that that was being done for the CIA, mm -hmm. basically. And this is not a journalist writing a report with protected sources. These are documents that are being validated in court mm -hmm. in Spain. So I think uh, uh, we will hear from that from the lawyers probably tomorrow, I hope. Well, I doubt that it's the prosecution tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is the prosecution? Yes. Oh, okay. Craig, what are your thoughts on uh, some of the comments that Fidel just raised here? Yeah. No, I think the, um, and the case was made quite strongly that you are extraditing Julian to a country which plans to kidnap or even assassinate him, uh, and which made active plans to kidnap or assassinate him, and therefore, how can you be confident of how they will treat him in custody mm. if they were planning to kill him? Uh, and I think that's that's an extremely important point. And the fact that um, you know this, it, it, it's not just dependent on the article in Yahoo News. That there is, first of all, we had. Um, the in the, we have protectors, protected witness two uh, in the extradition hearings actually giving direct evidence to this happening yeah. and so much has come out in the court case in Spain uh, mm -hmm. that this is not this is not rumour or possibility but this definitely happened the, the CIA was planning to assassinate him that's true but I'd, I'd like to make another point I, I was saying earlier that um, I thought the court appeared to give more serious consideration to the defence case than I'd ever seen a court give before in any of the Assange hearings. And I'd like to consider why that is. Uh, and this is where I think um, the fact that public opinion has turned round on the case, the fact that there's so much more support out there from Julian, the fact that campaigns have been so successful, the fact that almost all major media organisations have now started opposing his extradition, finally, uh, a bit seriously. Even things like the fact we had 16 members of the European Parliament in, in court today, um, uh, and we had members of national parliaments all around the world. Um, all of that campaigning is starting to pay off, I think. Uh, and we're now in a situation where once you have The Guardian and The New York Times and The Washington Post and, and other outlets all saying actively this should not be happening, judges can no longer be simply scornful uh, or, or do not feel able simply to dismiss with no consideration the defence arguments. They, they feel under pressure to be at least seen to pay attention 
to the defence and, and listen to the defence. And I, I do think the different atmosphere in the court today wasn't in particular a reflection of the personality or character of the judges. Uh, it was to do with the way the whole atmosphere around this extradition has changed. Uh, there's now much more heavyweight opposition, if, if, if you like. And that comes down in large part to the success of the campaign and all the people who have campaigned and lobbied and worked so hard um, for many for many years. Uh, and I think that's very important. I, I, I think that shows that public opinion can be affected. And, and yes, I, I, mean, I absolutely <laughs> take Chris's point. He's absolutely right. We don't know how that will actually be affected by uh, the eventual judgment when it comes. Um, uh, but the degree of respect shown to the defence case was, was new. I, um, I also agree with Joe. One thing that was very plain to me was the judges had read almost none of the background papers. They, they knew very little about the case. It, it, it was frequently obvious when the defence case were referring to things that had been said or done. They, they were always needing to be taken to the exact uh, place and, and it was fairly obvious they hadn't read it. You know, they were learning things they had not heard before, frequently, even though they were things which had been covered in the original extradition hearing. Um, so my expectation after today is that the uh, these judges are, are going to go back and read through and read up and, and learn more. So I'm not expecting anything fast to happen after the American government replies tomorrow. Um, I think we, we will then be in a position where the judges spend several months determining whether or not the, uh, the hearing will go ahead. And that's several months in which we have more time to campaign to change public opinion further. Mm -hmm. But I do think what we saw today was evidence for campaigning and changing public opinion, changing media opinion, changing political opinion can actually affect the court. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's very, very important. Now, when you mentioned, Craig, uh, the success of the campaigners, the advocates, the activists, I, I keep looking over here at Emmy because you have been a fierce advocate and defender of WikiLeaks. Julian Assange, as I mentioned at the introduction, you are also a member of the committee to defend Julian Assange. Can you speak about how you've seen over the past several years the support continue to grow and also expand mm -hmm. and kind of uh, cross beyond just, you know, mm. the different political parties or, or other activist groups? Well, it's in very interesting because um, from when I started <coughs> to now, all those years that have gone past, each year that have, has gone past, Julian Assange's situation has deteriorated year by year by year, yet public opinion has improved, improved, improved more on his side. Since his arrest particularly, we've seen a tsunami of change. Uh, both at uh, grassroots level, as well as political level, cultural level, internationally particularly. But I would like to make a distinction that this country, the UK, which has been the most ferocious uh, polemist of Wikileaks and Julian Assange, um, has, the establishment has resisted every opportunity to accept the points put forward in the defence of Julian Assange. Um, an example this morning at uh, Breakfast News, the BBC reported that uh, Julian Assange was wanted by the US for leaking classified information. Uh, I followed it immediately with a complaint in the official procedure for BBC complaints. And this is something we've been trying to do for decades almost, uh, trying to fight the narrative which is false. And uh, the surprising thing is, uh, even at this stage, on this day, where Julian Assange is facing his, probably his last uh, effort to avoid extradition, the national broadcaster produces a false reporting. False reporting which undermines his defense as a journalist, as a publisher, presenting Mezalika. So um, I'm, uh, you know, extremely satisfied by the campaigning which has been remarkable and uh, um, great uh, you know, recognition to his family, to Stella and to everyone at every level that has been involved in raising the profile and having such fantastic results. But uh, in this country, I find it, um, despite the popular opinion being on his side, very little opportunity politically 
to maneuver and influence the politics behind his extradition here, where the judges belonging to this country, this is the establishment they listen to, primarily. So there is this um, difficulty in this country in trying to influence the political environment. You know, I was thinking, uh, Nils Meltzer tells the story over and over again how he was fooled by all the stories that he heard, things like on what the BBC just reported, and then looked into it and his mind was open. So maybe this little bit of ignorance that the judges displayed today, like on the informants issue, it was clear in September 2020 that the U.S. was going to push that informant story down everybody's throats. That was their main thing, at least that's what it seemed at the time. And then we started learning more and more. Mark Davis, the Australian journalist and lawyer, who said he was with them the whole weekend in the bunker at the Guardian, and he was the one who was redacting. The Guardian went off playing golf. That's what he said, right? It was yes. golf. And <laughs> Julian spent did all nighters. And uh, then we learned about the fact that it was, and it was mentioned in court today. Oh, he didn't mention the newspaper that one of the partners leaked the the uh, password to the unredacted files in their book, and that's mm -hmm. how it got out there. And then others, Pirate Bay, Freitag, Krypton.org, all published the documents with the informants' names not redacted before WikiLeaks did. And that came up, and the, the selective prosecution was an issue brought up today. But I saw that the judges had no idea about this, because they believed this informant story, you know? But what about the informants? It's like that's all they knew about the case at times. They kept bringing that up. Yeah. And I think they were a little bit taken aback by that there's another side to this story. Let's hope that they, as Craig said, they go and Mark's, start reading up on it. Yes, uh, Mark Summers could have made it a little clearer Yep. that it was the aberrant behaviour by one of the media partners he that did. caused all he that. He kind of did. But he kind of did, but he had Maybe there was a Guardian well, correspondent in the room. Clearly I don't know. Was <laughs> Alan Dustbidger was in the room. He was in the room? Yeah. Was he right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the first... We've, I've been to every single court hearing the very first time. Okay. And um, I'm glad that he did. He has a moral responsibility for where Julian is now. Okay. And it's never too late to make amends. The judge referred to the joint statement that the newspapers did in 2010. Did you hear today? When yeah. she was referring to the, to the judgment of the first judge that she looked at it and she put in her uh, documents. The statement made jointly by these big newspapers Condemning the oh, right, that's the, the release, yes. the release yeah, of that the, was off the cable gate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the yes, you the response that. the response from the from the lawyer immediately should be, well, that was 2010. We know a lot more about all this now in the court. Actually, this has been discussed, mm -hmm. and the very papers that did the joint statement, all of them today oppose the extradition. Right. Exactly. Again, speaking to how the, the support has continued to grow and expand. Did you have a no, I just wanted to, that you reminded me, I forgot about that. That really ticked me off because yep. that was that statement that came out. They knew that they were responsible, the Guardian at least was, and they tried to blame it on, on Assange, on WikiLeaks, when they knew the truth and they put out that line statement and it winds up being quoted today, years yes. later, mm -hmm. uh, in the yeah. courtroom. So maybe they'll open their minds, hopefully, and get the real story about the informants, because... I thought he was weak on that. I, I, Who? Uh, Summers? Yeah. I thought he was really weak, because <clears throat> it wasn't... I thought he could have pushed back and made it clear that it wasn't WikiLeaks that was responsible for the leak of those names. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, he, his argument was, uh, there, you know, there was no harm and we have to That's balance right. out the public good with possible harm. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was probably the weakest, yeah. m his weakest moment when you say, Craig. Yeah, he, um, he did mention initially when it was first raised, he yeah. did say <laughs> it wasn't uh, WikiLeaks, it was 
the action of one of the newspapers involved in it. He didn't specify The no, Guardian. No. It was almost as though he were protecting The Guardian at that stage. Uh, um, I, I found it strange he didn't say, hey, right, mm. look, what happened is The Guardian, the deputy editor of The Guardian, and Luke Harding of MI6 uh, <laughs> published uh, <laughs> published the password as a chapter heading in the book. And Rustberg is in the room to confirm it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, at the time, I was sitting there wondering why he hadn't. Yes. I was thinking that there's obviously a reason, because he, Mark Summers obviously knows that, and there's a reason why he hasn't said it. Why hasn't he said it? Uh, and I, I kept wondering about it at various times during the day, and I never came up with a very good no, answer as to why, why he was well, trying to... To be fair, he was brilliant <coughs> in other parts. Yeah, yeah. it was great, but yeah. it was clear that the judges were clueless. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. And, yeah. and that was a, uh, let's call it a teaching moment. I mean, that was yeah. a moment when he could have laid out in detail, because they didn't have a clue. Yeah. No, right? they didn't. And yeah. he, I don't think that he got through. I, I think that he was too opaque mm. on a very important issue, because mm. the judges didn't just raise it once. They raised that issue Couple several times. times. Mm -hmm. Couple of times. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wondered whether he had quite cottoned on to how little the judges knew, to the fact that the judges, um, that, that was one of the cases when it just became very plain, the judges had not done their yeah. reading, they hadn't read the bundle, they had no idea what we were talking about most of the time. Um, but uh, isn't that commonplace when it gets to a higher level? That <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure. A complicated case like uh, that? Um, I imagine it is, but the, um, uh, and I, is there a, is there a convention, perhaps, that lawyers are not allowed to point out that the judges don't know what they should know because they've read it, they haven't read the papers? If, if, if oh, uh, was he relying on the judges now going away and reading the papers? I'm, I'm not sure, but I... Well, I, uh, you know, you know the, as an American watching yeah. all of this, yeah, it does have shades of Monty Python <laughs> uh, with everybody with their wigs and your lord and my lady and... Uh, the iron cage that likes looks like something out of Bleak House. You know. uh, I kept thinking of Bleak House, actually. Um, uh, but in every courtroom I've been in, a good lawyer is overly obsequious and and engages in nauseating flattery of the judge, no matter how clueless they are. So yeah. I I. I, I think that there I, I there was one moment actually where I think it was Summers said something and the and the judges reacted and Summers was like I don't know if you remember what it was but he reacted like I can't believe you could see just this momentary I can't believe you don't know what this is and I wish I could remember what that moment was but it was clear that he was cognizant of the fact that they had not done their homework they did not know the case yeah. Well, right now, I do want to take a moment to welcome another guest who also happens to be the editor-in-chief of Truth Defense, which is the platform that we are streaming on, also a journalist, Mohammed al -Mazi. Glad you were able to make it here. Uh, I know you've been listening to the conversation for a little bit now. Is there anything in particular that you would like to touch on or expand upon? Yeah. First of all, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's able to make it, which is apparently everyone who was able to make it before me. Um, yeah, there, there was the point uh, that I heard uh, just a moment ago made about the arguments that uh, Summers did and didn't present, or uh, likewise with Fitzgerald. I think it is important to, to be fair to them and to note that A, they only have a day, uh, B, the oral arguments are only certain arguments that they felt necessary to focus on and accentuate for the judges. There are obviously substantial written submissions as well, which went into certain subject matter that the oral arguments didn't. And um, it's important to remember that this is a permission hearing. So they're asking for permission to appeal. This isn't actually the appeal, even though they've been arguing some of the appeal grounds. And a l the focus, <coughs> therefore, needs to be on grounds that they think will lead to them being granted an appeal rather than debating matters of fact which could lead to a back and a forth and a back and a forth such as for example uh, who released the full unredacted cables first although Summers did note that the it was Krypton that did it so the, I think the reason why he was focusing uh, in part on the proportionality test 
uh, in relation to uh, releasing information versus the public interest on the one hand versus the harm it m disclosures may have done on the other is because they're trying to convince the judges that there is a balancing test based on jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights that says you need to apply it in cases such as this that Vanessa Breitzer did not apply, right? So since they're saying she didn't do this, it's therefore uh, an arguable ground of appeal. This is a failure in law, and that's what they're trying to focus on. They're trying to have as many points of law where they can convince the judges it is at least arguable that uh, Baratzer made a reversible uh, uh, error in law. And had she decided something differently, or had she applied the law correctly, then we could have ended up with a different result. Mm -hmm. So if they end up having more time with an actual appeal, then they can get into some of the other issues. But uh, you have to be careful not to be drawn into sort of factual arguments with the judges that could end up eating up your time where these are legal arguments they've, they've got to be able to make. And I thought that's the, it was interesting to see which ones they chose to focus on and not focus on. Part of it will be based on what they think are most important arguments, and the other ones, perhaps the focus will also reflect the extent to which they think these arguments may be contentious, and therefore they need to verbalize them and give the judges the opportunity to question them on it so that they don't just uh, fail on the papers, basically, because like I said, most of the arguments are written down. Excellent point. I see many of us here is shaking our heads in agreement. A good point. I also do understand uh, the other points raised here. I had the same feeling as well that the judge seemed to be uh, very fixated on this point about the redaction of the names. Anyone here want to want to follow up on these points? I think um, another thing we haven't really emphasized is that they, the defense spent nearly half of their time on, on the no political extradition point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, they, they absolutely hammered that point at, mm -hmm. at, at, at great length. And I, I think I've always felt that that's unarguable. I, I, I've always found very strange uh, the argument, which was accepted by the magistrate, that um, the as the treaty is not incorporated in domestic law, then the terms of the treaty do not apply, even though it's a treaty under which you are extraditing. Uh, that seems to me quite quite remarkable and the, um, <laughs> the, the uh, and as um, Edward Fitzgerald put it you know you you can't at the same time apply the treaty for the extradition and refute the terms of the treaty uh, uh, and uh, it, it it almost seems like you don't have to say more than that but in fact the first 75 minutes of the uh, of the defense case was spent hammering that out uh, and giving further further examples because in many ways that seems to be the strongest and most basic point. Well I think also the fact that they did a very good job of defining espionage as a political act. Yeah. I thought that was very clever. Yeah. Um, so okay you want to extradite him for espionage I thought he did you know he had the good about the, the legal background material to, to justify the statement that espionage is political in the eyes of the law. Well, also starting with Chelsea Manning and saying, this, I, I was putting out the, the live tweets for Consortium News and there must have been about 20 tweets in a row that where I was quoting Mark Summers saying the Strasbourg Court would say yeah. and how the Strasbourg Court would defend Manning would think that her uh, leaking because it was the offences of her employer, right? That, that's one of the cases where it is permitted, is protected. So they, they got from there by almost convincing the court that Manning should be protected. And then it, it was described as frivolous by Summers to pass on to prosecuting the publisher of this information. Yeah, I thought that was really strong. That was very powerful. Yeah. But the, the fact that they, the, they were mentioning Strasbourg, Strasbourg, European court, Strasbourg, I had a feeling that basically, not that, that they are giving up when they got to the, the European court anyway, but kind of saying, it's going to go there, and it's going to 
back here correcting you and you are going to be hum humiliated so let's avoid that because if, if you decide in this way it won't pass the test on a proper court in hu Europe yeah, get it right the first time, rather than yeah. get embarrassed by the by the by that the was the feeling court I had right. when, yeah. That's a very interesting uh, perspective as well. But you are uh, correct, Craig. That especially at the beginning of the hearings, there was quite a bit of focus about the the differences with the UK US extradition treaty versus the UK Extradition Act of 2003. And it was also noted, and this is just some background information again, to help the listeners understand some of the discussion here. Uh, it was stated several times in court and also addressed previously that under Article 4 of the US-UK Extradition Treaty, one cannot be extradited for uh, political offenses. And obviously espionage is a political offense. As Chris was saying, it was, it was very well uh, outlined today and it seems that it has been um, historically viewed in this way you have the textbooks and the case precedent or case law to to show for that as well I think we are um, reaching uh, potentially uh, the end of this evening's discussion so I just want to open it up any other points that you would like to address about this case whether it has to do with what took place in the courtroom today what is yet to come or um, anything that has transpired over the past uh, four years since these extradition hearings began. I believe the last time we were sitting here, uh, some of you were returning guests. This was four years ago, almost to the day, four years ago. So this has been a lengthy process for Julian Assange. He has been in Belmarsh Prison. That is the worst prison in the UK for nearly five years. So it's important to of course, have these discussions which focus on the legal aspects of the case, the technical aspects, but to also remember this is a friend, a brother, a son, a father, a husband who is suffering tremendously. But I'll, I'll open it up. Anyone want to share their last thoughts? Well, I would just say the pattern has been egregious violations of the most basic tenets of British jurisprudence, including eviscerating attorney-client privilege, charging somebody who wasn't in the U.S. and isn't a U.S. citizen with mm -hmm. espionage. Right. I mean, the list is kind of endless. And uh, I think that's, I really think that's one of the reasons why they don't want it covered. I mean, at some level, they must be cognizant of the fact that they're just violating every legal norm uh, to railroad Julian. So that, and that has been the pattern from the inception. I don't expect that pattern to change. I think that I've seen, I would see others, Craig's followed it from the beginning, of course, the, the, that that has just been consistent. And so, you know, I was a Craig who said, you know, he, how, you know, how could they possibly uh, rule against him? Uh, and I, I think that if you were in, uh, you know, in, in a court of law or in a judicial system that wasn't a show trial that functioned of course that would be completely um but the, the the pattern has been so incredibly egregious and it doesn't matter what hearing or what court he's in and i think we should be cognizant of that as we you know go into whenever this decision is uh, given absolutely and of course we have to take into consideration that uh, it's a it's a, a man's life because um um, he has been said before that uh, he may choose not to go to the U.S., uh, ultimately taking the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, is Britain and the society ready for the backlash of that? Um, well, he told that to Niels Melzer, didn't he? Yeah, this is what he told and Niels. So, exactly. And so, and so Britain is playing with its reputation. No matter what the outcome, people in this country, including myself, will never stop pursuing the truth on this issue and the justice for him because the work of WikiLeaks um, is the reason why he is in there. Um, the work of WikiLeaks has been an act of love, of self-sacrifice, the truest and most honourable motivation in forming the public for free and treating people equally because whoever goes into WikiLeaks website is equal 
It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, if you're rich or poor, or you're educated and educated, you're all equally treated. You can read information and learn and make informed decisions. There's nothing more honorable and nothing more expressive of the Western values of knowledge and enlightenment than what Julian has created. And to snuff out, after a long years of persecution, this honorable individual is a stain in British history which will never be expunged. Very well said. Very well. Any other uh, brief points? Yeah, I, th I think we, we have to remember this case is about political power. Mm. And it's about the ability of the state to hang on to power by keeping information from the public. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think p political power will dictate what happens next. My, my thinking is that it's very unlikely that the Biden people actually want Julian in the States before the election this year because it, it's a, a complication in an election year mm -hmm. in a time when they've already lost the support of a lot of their left wing over, over Palestine and Gaza mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to exacerbate that division. So um, I think these things will, will, will play out and my, my expectation is nothing much will happen after tomorrow. The, the, uh, the thing will be kicked into the long grass. Because in the meantime, of course, Julian is suffering. Julian is incarcerated. He's dying slowly in Belmarsh jail. They have him where they want him. So delay to them does them no harm. Uh, and my, my guess will be that after we hear the American evidence tomorrow, uh, the judges will take several months to make up their mind. Right, November 5th. And th then they will, <laughs> well, well, they'll, they'll take several months to make up their mind, and then they'll probably allow an appeal on limited grounds, and that appeal on limited grounds will probably be November, December, January. Uh, I, I, I would just say well that, the, that, you know, having, you know, covered the CIA, that's a state within a state. They are untouchable. Um, they have decided they want him. Um, they don't really give a damn th of the political consequences to Biden. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think any U.S. administration, of course it was Trump who, mm. the Trump administration that ordered the extradition, I think at this point the CIA is intent. And we have to remember that the CIA has transformed itself from an intelligence agency into a paramilitary force. Yeah. The CIA functions primarily now, its own drone program, its own black ops program, its own death squads, its and and I had I have friends who served in Afghanistan, and the CIA teams would you know airdrop in the middle of the night into a village, and uh, next morning the Rangers would go in and they'd blow them all. You know I mean they're just uh, out of control. So, um, at, you know have, following the institution, I don't think any political figure in the United States is at this point capable of defying the CIA's demand that you bring Julian back here. And it is, as we saw in the court today, it is has nothing to do with the Iraq war looks. It is false. That's my read of it. Well, today was, uh, you know, the Americans, uh, their lawyers got a chance to to, uh, you know, give their, present their side of the story and what they thought about the uh, appeal points presented by Assange's team. And it was basically, you know, the CIA sending a lawyer. That, that's what it was. We had the CIA in the courtroom um, just, you know, trying to hammer down this point, you know, ram this down our throats that uh, what, Ju what, what Julian did is supposedly illegal and, uh, you know, he released so many documents and, you know, it, it, these are just moot points. I mean, it's it's a repetition of what we heard already back in um, 2020 and 2021. Uh, it, it's it's nice, of course, to get back to the you know the crux of the issue instead of uh, focusing on uh, uh, other things. But nevertheless, it, it, these are absurd arguments. I actually wonder how she could just stand there for hours talking about this. So you know, she tried to make make the point that the the uh, WikiLeaks publications harmed people. Of course, there's no proof of, of this. You know, I mean, the Americans had a task force that was run by the army. They couldn't find a single human being that was actually harmed by any of the publications. Um, and then, of course, you know, Assange's lawyers responded to that by saying, you, you have to, you know, were this to go to the European Court of Human Rights, you have to uh, carry out a, a, a balancing act where you say, is it proportionate? You know, what, what was in the documents? What was being disclosed? Well, 
torture, you know, war crimes, uh, drone killings, assassinations. So, y yeah, that is much more important than the supposed risk that was, um, uh, you know, incurred to these informants. Um, and so, you know, the, the, this, this is this is a very very important issue because we 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 always have to present the fact that that what was in the documents is more important than whatever the United States claims happened and did not even happen. Um, and then, of course, they talked about the extradition uh, treaty versus act. Um, this is again a very uh, you know devilish uh, trick that they planned already twenty years ago when they first uh, uh, you know drafted this legislation um, and, and and signed it, of course, with the United States because they made sure there's a loophole. You know, you, the the treaty is the uh, the bilateral agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom and. Then when it comes to its implementation in English law, they made sure to leave out the, the part that says you can't extradite someone for a political offense, which opens the door to what we're seeing right now. So, you know, the, the, these were the main points of contention, and uh, I'm sure we'll get, to, we'll get better, back to a couple of others. Absolutely. Yeah. And just to make it clear for the listeners, on the first day yesterday, the defense had the opportunity to, to present its arguments. And then today it was the Crown Prosecution Service, which is representing the U.S. government. And there were three lawyers representing the U.S. government through the CPS. Uh, one of them was Claire Dobbin. I think she spoke uh, probably the most today. And then the defense had another opportunity to rebut the arguments of the prosecution. So that's just for your information to understand the basic structure here. Uh, but now I'll hand it over to you, uh, Dustin. What is your uh, general impression of, of what you witnessed today and yesterday? Yeah, I had a similar impression because I had uh, the opportunity to follow the um, proceedings already in 2020. Um, and today it was like listening to the same arguments again, like also yesterday, from both sides, but on on speed or steroids. It's like, uh, yeah. it was really short and also they always mention it, I have to keep it short, I have to, to we have to be fast. And um, I think that made it quite difficult for, for, for both sides to present their arguments in a, in a proper way, which sometimes, especially today, uh, for the US side led to some very unstructured arguments where I had difficulties following their arguments. Um, not only because of the audio issues which have been plaguing the court, but uh, also because of uh, the arguments. And um, still, um, especially like the Treaty Act stuff was quite technical, mm -hmm. still quite interesting to see because, uh, for example, I took the opportunity to look up the uh, Max Planck Encyclopedia for Public International Law article on extradition, which uh, says that basically every single democratic country which has extradition treaties has uh, excludes um, extraditions on for political offenses. Of course, yeah. And the funny thing is then that they there discuss that usually the issue is uh, what a political offense is. So people discuss that and not um, the, the question if it's part or not. And there, because what they also say, it, it wasn't even a political offense. And if you look up the encyclopedia, what it says, like there are like some clear political offenses, like espionage. Mm -hmm. And she today even said, like, oh, well, that's not that's not even a political offense. And a political offense usually is an offense which is directed only at the state. Of so course, yeah. if you are, of course, like committing espionage because you want to hurt your neighbor, then it's maybe not a political offense. But then it's not espionage. So. It was quite weird, some weird arguments, but it was always the case. And the big question is why back then the district judge disregarded the good arguments. And um, yeah, we can just hope this time that the, the two judges now will act differently. Absolutely. Now, Matt, I know that you were also present in the courtroom. You've also been covering this case uh, quite a bit. Uh, what, what was your general impression of today? Um, I mean, I'm more hopeful coming out of this than I have been in the other hearings. And I think a couple of people have said that to me as well. Um, just because the judges seemed more engaged, um, it could always be a PR strategy from their point of view in that it's the end of the road and they don't want to appear to be as dismissive as the previous ones. But I just felt they were engaging with the material in a way that I haven't seen before. The judges previously <clears throat> were not shy to show open disdain towards Assange, which you shouldn't do. Uh, it's really not a uh, uh, form to do that. And I mean, the judge, when Assange first came out of uh, came out of the embassy and was going to go to, uh, on his way to Belmarsh, Judge Snow actually called him a narcissist in the courtroom for no reason. And that, and that kind of carried on that disdain. But today I didn't see that, which was hopeful because as, uh, as anyone who's listening to that from a neutral independent point of view, listening to the arguments, you're sort of like, how can this go ahead? 
This yes. is clearly a political prosecution. It's clearly a violation of multiple articles in the European Convention on Human Rights, which they went for through right. like foreseeability, um, uh, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of receiving and giving information. So, um, uh, uh, and it did all get aired. And actually, I felt like the um, the US lawyer uh, today, um, uh, Claire Dobbins, she was struggling at different points. Mm -hmm. There was one particular point. <laughs> There was one point she struggled, but there was no sound, which was a theme. Uh, but there was one point she struggled, which I heard, which was when she was talking about um, the, the the cable releases and the fact that um, uh, it, it risked uh, uh, harm to the human sources. And then and then the judge sort of cl asked for clarification. She said, "But wait a sec, didn't another website publish all that beforehand? Crypto, right?" This I'm website. so glad they asked that yeah. question. Yeah, and then she sort God. of said she was she, she was shocked that she'd been asked because. It was usually hands off for previous judges, and then right. she said her argument was, um, "Oh no, 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 uh, yeah, it, it wasn't that. It was because he obtained the information uh, that the problem is. It wasn't that he released it first. And then you're sort of like, well, no, no, that's not the problem. No, you've just been saying that he put these people at risk, but the information was already out there. So, I mean, again, so I felt it went well, but again, we're dealing with the British justice system, which is an oxymoron. There is no British justice. Uh, from the start, this has been run, a, it's been a kangaroo court. The right. fact is even in Belmarsh maximum security prison as well, the penal system has been captured by the state in this case as well. He's in a maximum security prison. He's never been convicted of any crime apart from bail violation, which is a minor infraction in this country. Yeah. And it was a spent conviction before two years. He's now been in there nearly five years Absolutely. on remand. Really? And this is in a prison that they call Britain's Guantanamo. Uh, it's full of rapists, paedophiles, and Al Qaeda, and, well. and terrorists. And, and they've been given given better treatment than he has. Yes, and from actually, the same prison. one of the story early stories a couple of years ago we did at Declassified is I sent a Freedom of Information Act request to the Ministry of Justice to say, can I get a list of all the offences of people um, uh, in Belmarsh? And there were I think seven hundred and seventy inmates, and only two had been uh, were in there for uh, bail violations. This was when he was still in for for that. Um, which is amazing and like it was like 40 percent was violent offenses and all the sorts of worst crimes you can imagine so clearly the state is acting um and the political system is acting on a legal system which is uh, an outrage in itself but really assange exposed the u.s empire but i think he also has exposed the media secondly but he's also exposed british justice as a yeah. as a joke um so and, and in this case particularly today we've done a bit of work at declassified about the judges in the courtroom today, Sharp and Johnson, was it? Yeah, uh, yeah J Johnson. And Johnson had previ has previously acted for MI6, uh, yeah. the Foreign Intelligence Agency of the, U the UK. Um, and uh, Sharp's uh, deeply embedded in sort of the Tory establishment in the UK. Her father was a life peer. Her brother was the chair of the BBC until... Is he the one that got fired or yes, he had to resign? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, he was chair until last year when he had to resign. So... In that context, I'm not hopeful. Although I actually think, someone asked me, are you hopeful? And I was like, well, I'm hopeful that they might win this decision, but I think that might be part of the US strategy anyway. That they want it's, to, it's, the, the punishment is the process. And at the moment, you've got the prospect of a new Trump administration soon. Um, and uh, do they want Assange there in the next, under Biden in the next six months? Which, uh, or would it be better for them to have to, for it to go back to the appeal keep him locked up and in a in a hole in London for another couple of years which they could do because the other thing is even if he lo even if he loses this ruling um he can then apply to the European Court on, on human rights uh, of human rights and then that can take so that, and they can issue what's called a rule 39 straight away which would stay the extradition wouldn't stop it but then gives the European Court time to look at the case and I was told this week for a story I was doing, I interviewed Assange's lawyer in, uh, in Europe and he told me that it takes a minimum of 18 months for the European court to make, to make a decision. And can, in the case of Beba Ahmed, who was a, a US, oh sorry, a UK citizen that was extradited to the US in 2012, I spoke to him the other day, he, uh, he was, he, his ECHR um, application took five years to process. So it could go on and on and on. So it could be, like, if, if it goes back to the appeal court, it could be, we could be talking about seven, eight more years if the ECR. So I, I personally think that's what the US want. They want him just, they want, because yeah, I mean, it's going to be a, written that, so, yeah, yeah, and it's going to be a circus if he goes to the US, isn't it? Like, uh, um, so they, they want him dead here, preferably, <laughs> in my opinion.
Right. Now, to go back to your point about the line of reasoning of the prosecutor, Claire Dobbin, the way I took or understood her statements uh, with regard to the uh, release of these uh, particular documents where she was stating that uh, WikiLeaks did something you know, unprecedented by publishing this information. Then she was questioned by one of the judges. Well, by the way, in fact, these other organizations published first and they did not redact uh, the names. She seemed flustered by that. But then she made an argument stating that, well, he obtained those documents, what made it po which made it possible for these others to obtain the documents. And that doesn't make much sense because that told me that she thinks that he is therefore responsible for, say, the irresponsibility of others or for right, other people's saying. actions. That is pr pretty absurd. Yeah. So, can I just add one thing to that? Sure. that it's, it's not a crime to publish the name of a human source that you get told anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So, in fact, when I was listening to her arguments today, I was sort of like, this is a nail in the coffin for any kind of national security reporting at all. Because if you signed an Official Secrets Act uh, in the UK or its equivalent in the US or wherever it is, okay, yes, it is a crime. Yeah, that's too. different. But if you're a journalist and you've received that information, you are allowed to publish it, even despite all these arguments that the US is making. So I didn't. Really, so it really would be if they extradite him on the, on these on the merits of those US arguments. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a it's a nail in the coffin for the rest of investigative journalism, also freedom itself, because we're essentially giving the state the right to tell us what it is in the interest in our interest to know as journalists as citizens and that yeah. is that's that's fascism okay, can i just add the thing with crypto is so funny because the owner of the website he submitted a, a written testimony to the court and he said i published them first and nothing happened to me the u.s government never contacted me they don't want to prosecute me yeah. you know you know it, it was it, it really illustrated and underscored the absurdity of all this he's that he really it, it was a short and sweet thing I, and and this is already back in 2020 um during the uh, you know the, the time at the Old Bailey, but but you know it's been entered into the court and it's on the record. And number one, I'm shocked the judges don't know about this. Number two, I'm shocked that it, you know this is happening. And and the this shows you that it's selective that they want Assange. They don't care yes. about the law. And, and and again, it's not even a crime. But on top of it, it adds another layer and it shows you it's selective. Yes, mm -hmm. that's relevant to that. Is the practice in in this country to use so-called D notices, and then expecting journalists to essentially obey. And so these D-notices are government-issued uh, notices, usually by the secret services, uh, which themselves are secret. And so you're not meant to ever mention that, oh, we had a D-notice on that. That's internal news when your editor tells the, uh, the colleagues, well, we can't talk about this, we've got a D-notice. The D-notice itself is supposed to be secret, untouchable, and you're supposed to be silent. And it's really, I think, a, about enforcing that old system, which by definition is not transparent, is not democratic, uh, does not use uh, principles of a, you know, a free and, and democratic society. And of course, it's being challenged by the new technologies and uh, uh, the new forms of journalism, where you don't just have the big media companies, where there's collusion between uh, you know, big business, big media companies and government, as we know, mainstream media, but we have independent journalism. And it's this, it's this uh, sort of um, tug of war that's been going on in the last uh, decade or two, increasingly, of course. Um, and I think they haven't come up with a proper sort of solution how, you know, the system is going to handle this. And I think Julian Assange's case is a way of trying to maintain the old order. Mm. And of course he gets yeah. punished because yeah, Wiki, WikiLeaks by definition was uh, completely, you know, just ignoring all the, these establishment rules, mm. which were, you know, they're not, not democratic rules anyway, mm. um, and very hard to defend. And so I think it's, it's good that, you know, with this case, at least awareness is increasing and all the good work of independent journalists, you know, um, is spreading the word and people are becoming uh, much more aware of this. And we've had, Great demonstrations also today um, after the the court uh, closed uh, for business. The public is increasingly aware, and in some countries in Europe, um, you know, people are also demonstrating uh, in Germany, for example, uh, for Julian Assange. And people just don't want journalists to be put in jail mm. for doing their job. I mean, it seems crazy, and that's really what it's about, I think. Can I just go back on this because we actually got a D notice. You did. Well, we didn't get it. We, it's a. It's like you said. It's a very sort of um, loosely defined system on purpose. It's like a gentleman's agreement. 
and no one ever says no. So, so, so they sent us a, a, a the denotice committee sent us an email saying we've done this investigation on Paul Bia, um, who's the oldest dictator in Africa. He's the Cameroonian dictator, and my colleague Phil Miller had done a story about UK support for him and drawing up contingency plans and had the name of a special forces soldier who had drawn up or been involved in drawing up a contingency plan to keep him in power. We published that, they approached us and said, we are just approaching you in a sort of nice way to just to say, can you take, can you censor your article? And um, Mark Curtis, the editor was sort of, it's a really hilarious email chain because he's sort of trying to say, is this a denotice? And they're like, no, it's not a denotice. And they're like, well, what is it? It's like, it's uh, just some advice, and I was like, so is it official? It's like the mafia talking yeah, to you, but they're, they're, just but they're it, yeah. so they're so used to no one pushing back, so they didn't even know. It. Like honestly, you got to read it, uh, and then eventually we we refused, and we wrote an article about why we were refusing to comply with the denotice committee. Uh, but as you say, this happens all the time, and no one ever no one ever talks about it. It happened recently. Just to finish with this, it happened recently with Gaza, because there was a story in the Sun newspaper which is one of the most disgusting newspapers in the world but they got this they got this uh, story that the SAS had deployed to the British base on Cyprus for Gaza operations for hostage rescue apparently anyway the following day a D notice was issued to every single ed editor in in the UK saying do not publish any information about special force UK special forces involvement in Gaza that was published, no one publicised it. It was eventually publicised by one newspaper that received it called The Socialist Worker, which is like this tiny um, uh, leftist um, uh, weekly. Mm. And they publicised it. And not, But it's never been talked about by anyone else. And there's never been one more bit of information about the SAS involvement in Gaza since that day. Scandals. How so is that, that not relevant? Or well, and also you know? any journalist that's a... Because it's a voluntary system. They mm. say it's a voluntary system. We haven't... But that any journalist that is is complying with that denotice is, is complicit in the genocide in Gaza, in my opinion, yeah. because you're withholding Absolutely. information and you're not even at risk of prison, like uh, such. But it, it does go to how the system works, which is a gentleman's agreement. And they're all from the same Oxbridge University, they're all from the same private schools. They all go to the same private members club. Yeah. So they don't need the official rules. This is why Assange kind of pushed the boundaries and took yeah. journalism seriously. And yeah. then they had to say, well, actually, Shit, we don't have an infrastructure to stop this because no one's ever tried it before. And now we're seeing all the ridiculous arguments that they have to make to try and justify this exactly. prosecution, which Absolutely. is uh, ridiculous. Now, I do want to take a moment here to uh, introduce another guest who is, in fact, the editor in chief of Truth Defense, the platform that we are streaming on. Welcome, Mohammed El Mazi. We're very happy to have you able to join us again this evening. So I just went around asking the others for their general impressions about this case, what took place over the past few days. So if you want to weigh in on, on your general thoughts, and then I do also want to get into uh, the, the courtroom conditions uh, briefly, because a few of us have, have had some difficulties, and it speaks to some of the struggles we had as journalists to cover this. Although it's not a, a, it's a big point, it's still important for people to, to understand some Absolutely. of the hoops we had to jump through. But first, um, I'll hand it over to you for your general impressions. Uh, thanks, Taylor. Uh, actually, I just finished reading um, Kevin Costolo's article on the way over here that he very quickly wrote up and published mm -hmm. today uh, about, what is it, um, conditions uh, the court plagued with problems for media access in which he quoted like a number of us in there so it was interesting to see somebody who's taking it seriously not least of which because he was, was not permitted to have a remote access exactly. link despite the fact that he'd covered it previously he'd both physically come to the UK to cover part of the extradition hearings and he's also covered them uh, via video link and then for some reason he just couldn't uh, do this one so I was covering I was covering the hearings for the dissenter. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to agree that it, it's one of those things which I agree with Matt, but there's also, uh, um, who is it? I think Jill Laurie yesterday said this as well, or, or was it Craig Murray? That um, on the one hand, it, I have this bit of optimism. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I don't want to feel optimistic because I know that disappointment is a function of expectation. And the greater my, my optimism or expectation, the harder the pain when uh, you know the the decision comes out that which is which is not what I expected. So the judges seemed engaged. Johnson, in particular, the one who, who had part of his career was representing the national security state. Maybe it's because of the articles that you guys wrote about that that he thought, okay, I've got to really <laughs> appear that to be really interested in this, because uh, the previous uh, judge who the original judge who oversaw Julian's extradition case stepped down. 
uh, after Declassified UK published an article about her family's husband and son's national security links okay. and anti-WikiLeaks links. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a causal link, uh, but there's definitely a correlation. Article came out, and then she stepped down. And then somebody who I'm not necessarily certain was better than uh, replaced <laughs> her. So it's, you, don't, you, know, you have to be careful what you wish for. So the, it was interesting today. The one thing I'll say about this before we get on to other people to speak. I, I suppose I was so, sort of surprised at the severity with which they pushed the Julian Assange and WikiLeaks aren't legitimate journalists or journalistic organizations. It's not that they hadn't said that before, but that was sort of, uh, from, you know, from my recollection uh, from like two years ago, that's sort of in the background. It was there. They challenged it. It was an important point when they said he had... Their argument before seemed to be they have crossed the line. He has crossed the line from legitimate journalism when he when he oppressed Chelsea Manning to give him information. Yeah, like he's a recruiter eyes. of hackers yeah. or something. Whereas now it's they're not legitimate. They were never legitimate. Even before they even spoke to Chelsea Manning, uh, he was engaged in conspiracies to solicit confidential information. That's also known as journalism, right? Conspiracies to solicit. So if I go to somebody and I say, hi, uh, do you have any information that might expose, you know, corruption or, or malfeasance or wrongdoing? Mm -hmm. That's a conspiracy for me to solicit classified, you know, um, stealing. That's it. They started using the term yeah. stealing a lot this time as well. Not leaking, which is what they were saying before. So Chelsea Manning is not a whistleblower. She stole classified documents and gave it to her co-conspirator, criminal, non-journalist, Julian Assange. And this was they're hammering this for like a couple of hours. So I was kind of surprised with that. Uh, not the fact that they're defending their position, but just the severity with which they decided to take that position. Although as Mark Summers did, I think, a very good job reiterating, which is a point they made yesterday as well. The unredacted cables that they made a big deal about only represent three out of the 18 charges. So the, the position was, well, what's your excuse? If you're saying this is crucial to your case, then what are all these other charges about that have nothing to do with unredacted cables? Okay, are you going to dismiss those? I was like, well, no, obviously not. So it's not really about unredacted cables. And like... Um, Matt mentioned the, uh, the point about uh, going to the heart of national security journalism. Not only in the United States is it not a crime, and they've attempted to pass laws and failed in Congress, is it not a crime to name the identity of a source or an asset. But um, under the Espionage Act, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if what your motives are. It doesn't matter what the documents say. It doesn't matter if the prosecution, you know, admits, okay, no one was harmed. These are strict liability offenses. So all they're going to say is, is this national defense information? If the judge agrees, the next question is, did you possess it without authorization? Yes, guilty, 10 years. Next charge, yeah. same thing, guilty, 10 years. So when, when Claire Dobin repeated the mistake, I'll call it, of, of Judge Vanessa Bracer, when she said, these are issues that Julian can raise at trial in the States, that's completely false because he can't raise them at trial because if he attempts to raise any issue at trial that doesn't have to do with the technical aspects of possessing the documents, the prosecution will stand up, say objection, that's immaterial, the statute doesn't matter, it's silent on the matter of harm or damage or motivation, and the judge will say sustained. And that's exactly what judges have done in previous cases yeah. in the Eastern District of Virginia under the Espionage Act. Exactly. And it seems that the lower court judge, Vanessa Baratser, did uh, often state in her judgment that she was going to leave it to the U.S. courts to make determinations on several of these matters. Do you have any insight on this? What do you, do you make of that? Do you think it was perhaps out of just hesitancy, out of fear, or just not wanting to uh, really bring herself into that controversy, despite the fact that it is, of course, her duty to do so as a judge to, to make rulings on these matters and to issue opinions? Well, in fact, she can't because she doesn't have the necessary information to make such a ruling because they're secret. So, yeah. because, so she, she doesn't, she, she just can't. I think like in many aspects, what we have to keep in mind is that um, this is was a pretty big case for such mm -hmm. a court for for a district judge as well i don't uh, it's not about her qualification but usually those extradition cases are just rubber stamped mm -hmm. someone committed some some crime and then you just send them over it's fine this is how it usually works 
but this is such a huge case and I um, have to admit that I don't want to be a judge like do, doing this like such a huge case and at some points I, I felt that she was a bit overwhelmed and then it is an easy way to push it away mm. um, but also many and the, the US, uh, the US um, barristers uh, mentioned many times that this is something we can't talk about this is something we don't know we don't know about evidence this is this is, doesn't matter because it will be decided according for her of course it's a very comfortable thing to say oh yeah, well we can't talk about it here um, would be more difficult to to address these issues also but this is like in a reverse mode i think this is something julian's defense did um, yesterday is that they talked a lot about the european court of human rights where they was I felt wanted to give the court the impression that if you fail here, mm. you you're gonna fail in Strasbourg, mm. and you're gonna look bad. Yes. And whatever you you think about the judicial system, I think that the judges do have some like judicial honor, mm. and they don't don't like losing. Um, and I don't think they want to get embarrassed in Strasbourg. Yes. And I think the yesterday Julian's defense was appealing to that. Um, like judicial honor to some other. This has nothing to do with like uh, honor because of journalism or Julian, but only because of themselves. And I think this is something that could work. I, I don't think they want to knowingly lose in Strasbourg. So they, um, if they want to continue, if they want to extradite Julian, they have to make a better case. Uh, because right now, yeah, well, I think it w would not sustain in Strasbourg. Mm. Very interesting. I mean, from my perspective, when I listened to the judges' questions, it very much seemed as if they were almost poking holes in the prosecution's case. They were uh, obviously not aggressive or combative, but they were challenging them. And it was good to see that, as you had said in several others yesterday, really for the first time uh, when you look back at the at the broader scope of these extradition proceedings. Now, I do want to touch on just briefly here uh, the, the courtroom conditions. We did talk earlier before we started filming that there was um, some difficulties with being able to hear the judges and the lawyers present their case. And there was also difficulty uh, with seating. And then as Mohammed was saying, many of our fellow journalists who are not physically within the jurisdiction of England and Wales were prevented from covering this case remotely. And this is a, a new policy in this case. Previously, people were able to be anywhere in the world and have access and cover the case. People have been covering it for many, many years were prevented from doing so. And of course, we can only, uh, you know, make guesses about why that is. And it's not really helpful to necessarily uh, go into the realm of speculation. But um, any thoughts that you have about your experience? I know that you are supportive of Julian Assange and free speech and free press. What was your experience like in the courtroom as a yes. member of the public? Yeah, well, exactly. Starting with the courtroom. I mean, um, Attending yesterday as a member of the public, I was in the uh, the sort of overflow courtroom, and the acoustics for the first I don't know almost hour or something, at least forty five minutes was was so bad. Um, people were shouting, "We can't hear anything. We can't hear anything." The staff, the clerks, you know, pity them. They they didn't know what to do. They're clearly not IT experts or you know experts in, in getting good acoustics and microphones working. It was pretty much a disaster. It got a bit better, don't know exactly what they did, but still it's very, if you're a member of the public, an interested member of the public who wants to make use of the right um, to witness um, an important uh, public um, hearing such as this, which has a high public interest, you know, uh, content, I think, um, well, maybe you didn't hear very much at all, you know, so definitely the uh, the sort of logistics was was very disappointing, but there is there is this this other point I want to come back to Mohammed's uh, point on uh, on this attempt to de-legitimize uh, um, WikiLeaks and and well sort of also you know independent journalism perhaps even citizen journalism and because we've seen this particularly in the last uh, four years this mm -hmm. accelerating campaign against. Um, alternative opinions and to me it's almost as if um, the state big state and big business they just want to control the information it's really about information control 
And they seem to have come up with this idea that, well, we'll just define what journalism is. And, well, sorry, guys, you know, what you're doing and what Julian Assange is doing, well, that's just not defined as journalism. You know, I mean, anyone can claim to be a journalist, but it just doesn't pass our definition. It's essentially what they're trying to argue. Um, if you work for a legitimate major news company and so on, part of the, the cartel, that is journalism. And if you look at the recent uh, bills and, and uh, European, you know, Digital Media Act and all this stuff, um, uh, Freedom of Media um, Act and all these yeah. euphemistically called uh, le pieces of legislation, they essentially distinguish, you know, if you are um, an ordinary person, then, well, you can't do this, that and the other, and you can be punished for spreading misinformation. Mm. Um, but if you're a big business, I think this was the recent legislation, if, if you are a major mainstream um, media company, then, or you can make mistakes and maybe sometimes it's not accurate, you know, that's not misinformation and you won't be punished for it. And that is pretty scary what's happening. And I think, of course, uh, in many ways, Julian Assange was still under the, the old approach as we discussed. And so they have to use all the, the methods there. But it's so relevant for everyone because they are working on easier ways to shut down dissent and essentially suppress the spreading of important public interest information by simply having laws that just yeah. says, no, what you guys are doing, you know, it's just not allowed because we define it as it's not journalism. You do it like that so that you don't have to give them the Assange treatment, right? So institutionally, yeah. structurally, you know, funding-wise, uh, in terms of algorithmic changes on social media, so eventually it just becomes impossible for you to do any kind of meaningful alternative journalism. They'd much rather that than having to do, use stormtrooper tactics. Mm. The heavy-handed approach with Assange, I don't think is there. I mean, in Egypt and Turkey, yeah, they have no problem doing that with thousands and thousands of people in prison there. A journalist in particular, or media workers, but um, countries like Britain and the United States, they, they see how bad it looks. And I think they, they're like, okay, we've delivered the message. How do we prevent future WikiLeaks from, yes. from emerging? And not even at the level of WikiLeaks, even something at like 1% of, of what WikiLeaks does. Yeah, I mean, just to the, you know, the sound issues, I mean, you know, this is England. I mean, we, we invented, you know, going back to the telephone and, 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 and you know, stereo itself. It's scandalous. This is the, the Royal Court of Justice and you go in and the, the, the sound doesn't work and you go to the Old Bailey and the sound doesn't work. You know, this is, it, it, it's, it's not just because it's England, but it, it's just, it's really embarrassing for yeah. any country that wants to say it has open justice and it's a technological wonder. It's really shameful. It's so bad and it's not complicated. You just got to stick a microphone in someone's face. You, you, you know, they, they could, I, I will happily buy the microphone for the bloody <laughs> yeah. court if it comes to that, you know, and clip them on. It's not, it's really not that complex. They just don't want to. So I think it's a mix of conspiracy and incompetence. I don't know what it is, what the, what the, the ratio of each part of that is, mm. but that, that is the cocktail that we're talking about. And, you know, when, when it comes to um, the, uh, I, again, I, I didn't want to tweet this earlier, but I'll just say it here because it sounds better. You know, Claire Darwin, I think she, she maybe speaks too quietly because she's ashamed of what she's doing. <laughs> maybe it's a conscience that's, that's talking, you know, so um, maybe that's, that's something to do with it. But um, yeah, th this is really scandalous. I mean, yeah. for, forget like the, the, the content of the case for a second. The, the, just the technological uh, 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 hurdles that they placed and also the, the fact that people like Kevin and Mary and, uh, you know, they, they haven't been able to cover this case. I mean... It's funny in a way because uh, Mary's in Australia, so I mean that that's where Assange comes from. But she can't see what's happening to her, you know, compatriot, her fellow citizen. And then when it comes to Kevin, he's in the United States where Assange is headed, mm -hmm. hopefully not, and he's not allowed to know what's you know what will become of him. I think that's just uh, it's really ironic. Um, and of course, you know, the uh, the this this um, rant, if you want to call it that, that they went. To, um, you know, they, they went on about today regarding WikiLeaks. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so farcical that we have to explain that, yeah, you know, torturing people is worse than harming informants. I don't yeah. give a crap about the informants. You know why? Because they torture people. They, they kidnap people from the streets of Europe and take them to black sites and then sexually assault them. You can go read the case files. That's what happened. It's because of Julian Assange that we know these things and we were, and victims of the CIA could prove that in court. You know, just snatched off the streets in the EU, which is supposed to be, you know, we, we, these are supposed to be safe, democratic countries. And you have to wait for, 
you know, Julian Assange to publish the documents and then go to prison for you to get some justice from the, from the, you know, what the CIA did to you. And then your government will protect the CIA agents over you. I mean, this is so scandalous for European governments as well. We have to underscore this. It's not just England, you know. It's also yeah. Spain, Germany, Italy, uh, yes. uh, all of them. They, they, the U.S. have have their claws in them firmly, and and that's not an excuse. To say like it's just the Americans. No, the, the people in those countries are also complicit. Which we know because of WikiLeaks, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's WikiLeaks, the irony. WikiLeaks uh, cables also showed that the U.S. government was interfering in the prosecution, the attempted prosecution, because there were investigations being opened up against CIA and others. And the U.S. government was actively intervening to stop those cases from from proceeding. And we know that because of WikiLeaks. So we even know that WikiLeaks itself was a target of the national security state in 2008 uh, because of a leak to WikiLeaks that said, you know, that it should be considered a hostile entity. And that was in 2008. This is well, this is two yeah. years before Chelsea Manning. So... And it was a much smaller organization, and most people had never heard of it. Actually, Krypton had a, a far wider reach, was far better known among most journalists than WikiLeaks were, was at the time. I mean, that, even at the time of publication of the cables, which is a point that was made actually by a computer expert. It's wild to think about that. Yeah, right? yeah I know, because I, you know, I mean, <laughs> who thinks of Krypton now, right? But um, at the time of the publications, Krypton was much, was much more well known. And more importantly, the Google algorithms were more likely to link you to crypto right. at the time than it, uh, than it was to uh, WikiLeaks at the time. One quick point on the media access. So, I applied early. I have covered every single hearing since April 2019. Um, I got in yesterday, got into the, the press section with a table, great. I came in today even earlier to make sure I got in. Wait in the queue, when I go to get there, no, no. In fact, I do get in. I sit down, and then a clerk comes to me and said, "Oh, um, uh, the all of the press seating, all of it inside, are reserved for Associated Press." And by that, they don't mean the AP. They mean news outlets that have been given designated Associated Press status, which is whom? BBC, The Guardian, Sky, various establishment outlets. And so they're like, "Oh, so where am I supposed to go?" Like, okay, you go up to the public gallery up there. And I'm like, I have my computer. I need to be actively typing. I also have a physical disability. I cannot write. There, this is the public gallery. There's nowhere to put your laptop yeah. on there. And she's like, well, I don't know what to say. It's like, but yeah. I'm a member of the press. This is the press section. You're saying I need to go up to the public gallery where I can't do press work because some journalist who is not here and has not <laughs> queued up just because of his association with the BBC or what have you or is attached to an establishment outlet. It's probably a spook. Means, and you should see their face while they're standing by the position. You could tell that, like, since I'm raising it, I'm like, this is outrageous. I've covered every single hearing over four years. None of these people know the f f first fucking thing about this case. I see people that, who I know, I don't have a problem with them personally, but that I have never seen them in any of the hearings, yeah. the dozens and dozens of hearings, right. because their news outlet hasn't been sending them to cover it. I've been paying my own way and been paid by, like, uh, indie outlets, like, hemorrhaging money so that I could cover every hearing. Yeah. Uh, in the end, I had to go downstairs at the bottom where the press section was using the live video link because the, there's... I couldn't even get to it after they threw you out. Me well, and Chris had just sat well. down. They threw us out, and we had to go like in the same room. Like, just why? There's no one there. So why took like, you guys out? Yeah, oh, <laughs> like I have to put the laptop on my knees instead of a table because there's an invisible journalist that goes like. On the we table. all have press cards. Wow. We all did it on time. We all did it early. We've been here before covering it, and some some people. I was just. It's out. What the fuck is the point of having a queue? If you're going to say there's some press, but not all press. Or all press are equal, but some are more equal than others. Yeah, it's my yeah. point that you were I, I just want to bring up one point which I found so unusual but very interesting. I was actually outside the courtroom waiting to get in. It was uh, first thing in the morning, and one of the court staff members looked at my ticket and said, "Okay, you have to go upstairs." I said, "Well, I was, you know, in the uh, lower level yesterday. I'm press. I." I asked to be here, I've been approved, and they told me that the judges decided that the press should go on the balcony on the second level, and the public is to go on the first level, and that was because they were worried that the members of the public could be angry protesters, and if they're in the top, the second level, that they could potentially throw things at those involved with this court case, say mm -hmm. the judge, the judges, or the attorneys.
which is such a, a ridiculous uh, oh, wait, thing so to suggest. Wait, so they wanted them closer to the judges. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yes, exactly. It what? doesn't make any sense. But that's what they told me. I was fortunate enough I was able to be on the first level. But they did also ask for my ticket, my card, and, and wanted to... Uh, they, they told me, basically, if someone with the AP uh, comes in, then you have to uh, move. But anyways, I don't want to harp on this point too much because we should uh, focus on the substance of the case but I thought no, it was important it for the important. listeners yeah, they, 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 they want to hide what's going on yeah. I yeah, think no, it, no. it goes to an important point which is like a central tenant of uh, the justice system is open justice yeah. mm -hmm. that you have to be able to access information about the judges in, if it's a jury about the jurors uh, about uh, uh, see the case get transcripts this case has just been there's been no open justice. They made it as difficult as possible to access him in Belmarsh, even for civil society. You know, Rebecca Vincent, mm -hmm. head of campaigns at RSF, had a had a, 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 a an appointment to see him at, at Belmarsh and was turned away at the right. door. And you yeah. and this is stuff that you see yeah. in places like Turkey or so. In fact, I was sat next to Chan Dundar today. I don't know if you guys know him. He's the he was the editor of a, a major newspaper in Turkey, but he was persecuted for journalism, much like Assange is. And he, had to, he now lives in, in exile in Germany. And I said to him, how's this compared to what you put up with the Turkey? He said, this is, Turkey's better. But in terms of open... <laughs> and, that, and, and Rebecca Vincent so said the these same are thing. allied countries. Yeah. You know, and, Egypt and, Turkey. And, uh, and, and you're just sort of thinking... It's like you said, you, it's, there's probably not much point speculating how much is incompetence to conspiracy. But they're definitely 100%. No one is actively taking the seriousness of this case uh, seriously, yeah. like uh, if you, it, the fact that there's going to be all these people, you'd get a bigger courtroom. You'd make sure the technology, if it's shit, which it is, make it better for this case because it's. <laughs> there was one bit where it cut out. They cut out all the time. I could barely follow a lot of it. But and Chip Gibbons, who's one of the American um, uh, 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 Assange analysts and supporters who come from America. He just turned around and just went, this is the trial of the century. <laughs> and I'm just like, you're right. Like, this is insane. It's like, we're, we're like any uh, self-respecting uh, country and self-respecting justice system would make sure when all these people are coming ar from around the world to see this trial of the century, the most important press freedom case, maybe in history because of the extraterritorial reach it gives the US, you'd make sure they could ac at least access it. But they didn't. And um, I mean... <sighs> It's, yeah, it's it, brutal. But you know, the judge yeah. made a big deal about it after. So, oh, I've heard that there were problems. That's not okay. So, if there are issues uh, for people who are inside court or, or watching via live link, please tell me that. And of course, I'm hearing this while I'm now designated in the in the basement, listening via live li video link. So, I was like, well, at least her voice came through. Then, as soon as the barrister <laughs> yeah. starts speaking, I couldn't hear anything they were saying. And, and we're instructed: do not put comments into the chat of the video link thing. But it's like. I have to. So I put in comments. We can't hear. And then other people start doing it as well. Yeah. yeah. At, at, at some point, the judge asked uh, one of the U.S. barristers something. And he replied. And then he was not speaking at the microphone uh, mm. anymore. Like that, you have to, They have to speak directly at the microphone. Then it's fine. fine. So we, we told the clerk, the clerk, like, we can't hear anything. And he was like, yeah, yeah it will be fine. He will speak to the microphone again if he finished his, his reply. <laughs> like, but we, we are not here like for a selective stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. The maddest thing today was I left because I needed to go to the toilet from the press bit. Press bit. Uh, it wasn't a press bit, but um, and I'm walking out towards the toilet, and the guy's like, "Oh wait, just to let you know, um, you might not be able to get back in when you go to the toilet." I'm like, "What do you mean?" I can't go to the toilet. And he's like, no, 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 because it, it might fill up while you're going. I haven't eaten the last two days. I didn't have lunch because I was afraid that I, I could eat. Yeah. That's yeah. mad that, that, that they've got a policy that you, you might lose your place as a member of the press yeah. to see the trial of the century because you need the toilet. Yeah. Madness. Yeah. I couldn't get, I was waiting for so long in the lunch area during lunch that I, I couldn't get lunch. So I had to run back to the press room because if you log out, if you don't try to log in five minutes before, at least five minutes before the thing, they won't let you into the video link. What so I had to run back there, start it, and then run back out to try to grab a flapjack, something to yeah. like shove into my stomach. Yeah, what does it matter what time you join? Yeah, yeah exactly. Watch. Why do they care? It's all automated. I, I have a suspicion. I think that they are not able to mute everything. So they, if people join, they, maybe they're not muted. Because yesterday we had people popping up. And like in the yeah, video, like with the I, camera, I so, yeah, so like every like I just I think what I wanted to mention it's about audio quality, if the viewers can hear us clearly, then the technical team here is doing a better job than the court Without technical the, team oh, yeah. uh, in, of a nuclear country. Yeah, <laughs> just to, to, to broaden out the discussion 
again, so as you were saying, Matt, um, justice needs to be open, transparent. Mm. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be the reality of secret court trials in this country, mm. uh, which is another story, but it, it shows the attitude. But you're right, and everyone agrees, justice needs to be transparent, open. And then the other point is, in a democracy, and we shouldn't, I think we should just, um, you know, remind ourselves of this point, democracy only works if there is true journalism. And that means proper critical journalism, investigative journalism, alternative journalism, mm -hmm. not the bought and paid for corporate journalism. Because who is there to hold um, the, the government, the powers that be, the establishment, the big business uh, interests to account, if not proper journalism? Mm -hmm. And everyone understands that. And yet, that's, of course, what's being targeted and being suppressed. So there's, mm. that's why it is the trial of the century, mm. because it's about everything, really. Mm. Yeah. I do want to touch on uh, the U.S. Uh, assurances that were mentioned uh, just a, a few times today, just briefly, because I know that this is something that you actually wrote extensively on, yeah. because this is a point that's brought up by the prosecution, often to counter the defense arguments, especially when they're talking about the treatment of Julian Assange if he is extradited to the United States. And uh, later on during this extradition process, the United States came forward and said that he won't be subjected to SAMs. He will not have to serve his pretrial. Uh, he won't be put in pretrial detention in ADX Florence, which is not a pretrial detention center anyway. So the assurances don't make sense um, on face value. But there's a history of the United States breaking these assurances. You've written yeah. about this briefly. If you want to touch on that, and then I also think um, we should speak about uh, Assange's health, which I do think ties into uh, the assurances as well. Absolutely. Because that's, after all, why the U.S. government probably felt compelled to br bring these before yeah. the court. I mean, it's scandalous that for two years now we've been talking about his health. I mean, obviously, I, I'm not saying it's not important, but the, the, sure. the trial, the case should not yeah. center around whether he, he's healthy, like hypothetically, if he were you know, at 100% mental and physical health, does mm -hmm. that mean you send him to prison? Like mm -hmm. what kind of you know, threshold is that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the assurances which, which you know, helped the, the uh, US lawyers to then overturn the decision not to extradite him and okay the extradition were just based on, on, on what um, uh, Taylor outlined. And the United States, they, they you know, uh, this is a case cited by Julian's lawyers, Mendoza, and uh, I, um, you know, he's, he's dual citizen, U.S. And, and Spanish, and I published these documents from his case from the uh, U.S. State Department and the DOJ and the, the Department of Justice, because what he got is much better than an assurance. An assurance is like, a, you know, it's on, it's on a napkin. It's just a meaningless piece of paper given by one foreign, um, uh, you know, foreign ministry to another. That, that, that's it. That's it. But what he got is a legally binding contract because the assurances are too weak. The, the, the United States tried to play the same game initially, and the... What, what, what Mendoza's lawyers did is they went to the judiciary and they said, like, what, you know, can you really trust this? So the Spanish courts told the Americans, you either give us something more concrete or you're not having him. And, and this was actually really just about his rights under the European Convention on Human Rights, that he mm. would be close to his family. That he goes to America, serves, you know, he gets, he gets tried. Whatever sentence they give him, he comes back and he serves it in Spain so he can be close to his family. This is a right that everyone has uh, under the ECHR. So... Um, you know, you, you can't put someone on a, on a penal colony, you know, 2,000 miles away from, from their family. Uh, so they, they were forced to sign this contract and it was Spain that signed it, the United States that signed it through the embassy in, in Madrid and Mendoza himself. And then when, once he gets to the United States, they start stealing, uh, you know, millions of dollars from him because he, they wanted him for marijuana, but he was actually already rich through construction. Mm. So they started taking way like like seven times more money than, they, than he had actually uh, supposedly sold him marijuana, right? And they never caught like a single ounce of it. The point is though that they started like, you know, robbing him blind and then after that they would refuse to send him back. And he asked for a copy of the document of this contract. <laughs> you know, it's like a banana republic. They, they gave him a copy without his signature so he can't go to court. And then one of the judges in Spain um, uh, anonymously sends it to him because he, he rallied so much support uh, for his case in Spain and he sued the Spanish executive twice in the Supreme Court and won just because they violated his human rights and did nothing because we have to remember that th that Spain failed to tell the United States, hey, come here, what, what are you guys doing? Give us Mendoza. 
you know, because they're another party to the contract. And mm. because they're controlled by the United States, they did nothing. So he won. And, and he, when he got that, he, he, um, he went to civil court against Obama's uh, attorney general, who was Eric Holder. Mm. And then when that happened, they said, OK, go back. You're giving us a headache. So you see, it, it shows you the power of these contracts. But again, going back to Assange, Assange is not even getting this contract. Yeah. And, and were he to get it, we know the United States would break it anyway. And the United Kingdom would not enforce the contract. Mm. And so, you know, whatever way you look at it, um, you cannot trust what the United States promise. Even if it is a legally binding contract on paper with a signature, it is mm. garbage. It is toilet paper. Mm. Mm. Do you remember the... How was the guy with the hook? Uh, Abu, Abu Hamza, Hamza. Abu Hamza, yeah. Hamza yeah. yeah. Was Abu very Hamza. similar there, didn't they? Also, like, if assurances. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. They said he'd get proper health care and then, you know, put in Sam's. As as I, remember, I remember that uh, during the hearings they told the story that he's, uh, they were, like, uh, loosening the measures and stuff. Like, oh, it got better for oh, him. Right, I and then he wrote a letter to his son. He said something he, like, give my love yeah, to my grandchild. Yeah, tell my grandson I love him. And then they declared it unauthorized contact to a third person mm -hmm. and like set everything back to, to the worst. It's, uh, yeah. So I, I also felt like even if they, in the beginning, stick to the assurances, uh, to the assurances they will find a way yeah. Yeah. to, to yeah. move away from it. Yeah. So especially, I think what people have to keep in mind is the assurances only cover what happened until now. So if something else would come up, mm -hmm. maybe like misbehavior or whatever they come up with, they could always like, okay, this is not covered by the assurances, so yes. go yeah. to yeah. Sam's. Which defeats their purpose. Yeah. Because the whole point is, he's a substantial risk of suicide if they treat him in a particular way. And he, they say, fine, we promise we won't c help him commit suicide unless he says or does something that leads us to change our mind. So it's like, okay, the high court have literally just accepted meaningless assurances, which even on their own face, right, or have such a great qualification that it's basically like saying, and this was what they tried to appeal to the Supreme Court on, where they said, like, uh, can you actually accept a qualified... Uh, restriction on torture because you're saying that the High Court have accepted that certain conditions will lead to his death right that satisfies the definition of torture and they're saying we won't torture him to death unless we change our mind and decide we want to torture him to death the High Court said oh yeah well that's good enough for us and that uh, it's absolutely shocking and that is and and they refused to certify that as an appeal ground to the Supreme Court so they couldn't even go to the Supreme Court and I yeah. think they did that deliberately because the Absolutely. Supreme Court would have had to have considered that mm -hmm. and would have been in a very embarrassing situation of either on, because uh, Supreme Court cases are actually televised, right? So um, actually saying that the, the prohibition on torture in the UK is no longer absolute or saying that these assurances are worthless. And they protected the Supreme Court from doing that by simply not certifying it. It was a complete bogus bullshit decision. I have absolutely no respect for the judges who made in the High Court who made that decision because they're saying yeah. torture is fine if the U.S. government decides they're going to do it and we'll dress it up. Yes. So, so yeah. really, the underlying theme here is um, that the the secret services, the deep state. You know, we have intelligence uh, agencies, the so-called intelligence agencies. They really. Uh, operational, um, covert operational um, uh, agencies that engage in, frankly, illegal activities, um, they are fighting for control. And so they want to clamp down on everything. And that's really what we're witnessing, isn't it? Um, and of course, the biggest challenge to them is the public actually knowing and finding out what's happening, that we have these organizations engaging in illegal activities, but being let off. Mm. And I mean, there's, there's a great book uh, by Fletcher Prouty called The Secret Team. Was really, uh, he wrote this in, in the early 70s. He was the uh, chief of covert operations, of uh, special operations, at the Joint Chief of Staff in the White House, mm. all his life in the CIA. Um, but then he became basically a whistleblower and wrote this book, which was banned for two and a half decades. But then later with the internet, it's now out, you can get it easily, the secret team. And he shows that the CIA is essentially illegal. It doesn't even have the powers that it's in reality exercising. taking and exercising, usurping. And the way it works is because once you get into this, and you've got the black budgets and there's these trillions yep. missing, they're all off, off the books. Mm -hmm. um, then um, what they're doing is, and because they always use you know, national security as the excuse, 
all those who in a democracy are supposed to be the sort of checks and balances on such agencies, you know, securities agencies or police or anything, uh, they make sure it's their own people. And then nobody is allowed to name who is CIA and it's a secret. So nobody knows that, say, the, the congressmen or the senators and the various committees who are supposed to watch this, well, they're all CIA. And that's how they do it. Um, so the whole thing is actually illegal and the public needs to know and be, be aware. And, that, and this is the battle that we're fighting and that Julian has been fighting, isn't it? And of course, it's the battle against the most powerful enemy, really. And he's exposed everything you're talking about. Yes. Because I agree, like, I think that the, the left needs to engage on this issue. They call it parapolitics. Um, uh, how all the different secretive agencies you're talking, talking about that have huge amounts of power. In fact, they have executive power, essentially, yeah. because if you talk, they call it the blob in Washington, right? Um, the, or the, the confluence of different like arms, uh, manufacturers, national security officials, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's becoming more and more obvious in the case of Assange because you have Trump who issued the initial, or the Trump administration issued the initial indictment. It's been carried on by Biden, who is apparently politically opposed to mm. Trump, but, <laughs> is, but there's a bipartisan parapolitics consensus in Washington Amazingly. yeah and uh, I think that's becoming more and more clear I mean it also goes I have to say for the judicial system as well because we feel like to, uh, independent judiciary is this concept we have which is a fundamental tenant uh, of democracy but we don't have an independent judiciary in this country we don't yeah. we mm. clearly don't and we don't even have a the, the government ha we don't have a media that's exposed it. That's maybe the scariest part for yeah. me because the work we've done at Declassified has shown clearly how involved the UK government is in the persecution of a journalist. Mm. This is a journalist that is on record as the country that wants to extradite him has plotted to assassinate him. The country yeah. that wants to extradite him has spied on his privileged conversation with his lawyers. It doesn't get more serious than that stuff. I mean, any case would just be yeah, thrown out. And yeah, and thrown out. And yeah. they haven't done... And in fact, in the case of Daniel Ellsberg in the 70s with the yeah. Pentagon Papers something much less serious. They burglarized the, the offices of his psychiatrist to get dirt to smear in the media. That got, the, got, it, got it thrown out. Nothing in this case could get it thrown out. Yeah. But the, we found that the UK government had deployed 18 staff on the secret operation to seize him from the Ecuadorian embassy. Now, Ecuador is a friendly country. Uh, uh, asylum is a right enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he's a journalist who's, who was avoiding persecution, which we're now seeing the results of. How how can any government justify putting 18 staff on that secret police operation? And the Vienna Convention, you can't go into an embassy. No, mm -hmm. and, but they've never had to justify it because we did that story, first time it was revealed, the amount of, uh, and it's never been covered in the mainstream media. That's why sometimes I feel like I'm living in an Orwellian yeah. existence yeah, 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 yeah. because yeah. truth just doesn't reach a certain level. Even like today, I felt it with at, at the thing. There's an amazing um, activist um, outside and, and people are engaged but it's still on quite small numbers on a sort of general level. And I'm thinking this is the trial of the century. This is going to define freedom globally mm -hmm. for decades, if not centuries. And barely, it's barely touched in the mainstream media. It should be on the front page of every single mainstream newspaper. Absolutely. Front page. They should have been campaigning for years mm -hmm. to get him out. Not one newspaper has launched a campaign. That's why I sort of feel like we're already living in 1984. Yeah, we have this yeah. guy rotting in a prison in the centre of London for five years yeah, and no yeah. one's mobilised. Civil society's been exposed, the media's been exposed. Everyone who should come to aid someone who is the victim of uh, raw power, exercised in the most crude way, they've gone absent. Yeah. Um, and it, it's scary because if they can yeah. do it to him, they can do it to anyone. Of right. course, exactly. Yeah. And exactly, uh, as you say, and you mentioned the, the Ecuador embassy. Um, and of course, you know, why did Ecuador suddenly change its mind? And this is where you see how these things are connected. The International Monetary Fund yeah. suddenly um, gave them a loan mm. uh, for, I think it was $7 billion. Um, dollars. And of course, there is the published uh, conditionality. But then there's always the not published, the confidential conditionality. And suddenly, you know, with billions of dollars at stake, and there's usually ways for creaming off a few percentages here and there for, you know, intermediaries and various parties <laughs> for their personal uh, accounts. Suddenly, he was kicked out, essentially. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's other cases where basically when big decisions are made involving money, whether it's the European Union withholding 7 billion 
euros from Hungary mm -hmm. and then there's secret agreements on what, what should happen and which people should be getting you know silenced and whatever or uh, or yeah essentially uh, badly treated for their uh, for their work for truth and and publishing um, you know important information of public interest that's how it works mm -hmm. and so you've got all the major international um, national international power players involved in this isn't it but the, the, the weird thing about this whole system is it's like you were saying about this two-tiered media where the establishment media is the official media but they don't mm. do proper journalism and then all the rest of us that are actually doing proper journalism we're not proper journalists yeah. because yeah. we're doing proper journalism yeah. Yeah. Exactly. it is a William yeah, well, like, so, so the information is out there now yeah. But it just doesn't reach, so the whole way propaganda is done here, I believe, having done the work we've been doing at the Classified for years now, is a propaganda by omission. They don't need to outright lie to you, although yeah. they do do that sometimes, but most of the time it's just to leave out any information you need to have a proper yeah. understanding. Yeah. In the Assange case, for example, another story, sorry to bang on about our stories, but they're the ones I know best. <laughs> like the, there was a, like the, the minister who orchestrated the arrest of Assange and the seizure from the Ecuadorian embassy in 2019, mm -hmm. Sir Alan Duncan. He was a, is a 40-year good friend of, Sir, uh, of I, uh, Chief Justice Ian Burnett, who green-lighted Assange's extradition. Right. How, if, if any media reported that, if The Guardian had put that on the front page of The Times... It's a scandalous whole, conflict of it, interest. It was scandalous. Yeah. Yeah. He would have had, either had that, that ruling would have had to re, be revisited, yeah. or if it had happened before, it had to be, he'd have had to recuse himself. Like, but it just does. It's never been reported anywhere. So we live in this this discourse yeah. and this narrative control where any information which is not conducive to state or corporate power is just erased from the public record in the main in a sort of mass sense in terms of mass media. Well, I mean, you can see it in alternative media, and uh, I think that that's what you, the point you made is that I think that what Assange did, which none of us have ever done, is he made that kind of critical radical journalism which really is in, involved in exposing power mainstream he did it through the guardian and stuff and that was like a sh like a, a a short burst of democracy before they yeah, slapped yeah, the yeah. lid back on enough of that now. yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well we do know that the case is now left to these two high court judges who are going to determine if Assange can appeal before the UK courts once more, or if he enters into the extradition process, of course, there is still an opportunity to pursue through the European Court of Human Rights. Matt, I know that your colleagues at Declassified UK have investigated both of these judges. I think this is a good place to start to wrap up our discussion this evening. If you would like to uh, provide an overview of some of the findings that may be of interest to the listeners and then others who want to just share with the viewers your, your general thoughts of what comes next. But I'll start with you, Matt. Uh, what, about the judges today? Yes. Yeah, in, uh, in the, well, the report, yes. I think it'll be interesting for people yeah, to hear so, those details. Uh, well, Sharp, the, it, it basically is it, a theme. We've been looking at judges all the way through mm -hmm. this case yes. because there's, it's a rich seam and no one else seems to be doing it, so we thought, why not? Um, uh, Sharp today, uh, Victoria Sharp, her, uh, she, was a political, she was appointed by Theresa May uh, so uh, by a Tory, uh, her brother, her father is a life peer, or was a life peer, uh, which is a we have an undemocratic system in this country where the, the second chamber is unelected, um, and it's full of um, basically just aristocrats mm. who uh, have ruled. You, you elect your senators. That's not a thing. You. <laughs> yeah, 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 they've ruled the country for like, since the Norman invasion. Basically, yeah. they divvied up the <laughs> land and gave themselves bits, uh, tight, nice titles, and they're still there. Uh, so that's a, that, and then um, her brother was um, chair of the BBC, another uh, sort of establishment figure. Um, uh, so she's just deeply embedded in the establishment and has all the views. I imagine that someone who is deeply embedded in the establishment does about um, issues uh, uh, around democracy and uh, 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 the journalism that WikiLeaks practices. Um, and then um, the other judge has previously acted for MI6, um, which is the Foreign Intelligence Agency of the UK. And in fact, it's, fu well, it's, it's not funny, is it? But it's, I guess it is quite funny, but the, even, the, it's funny how blatant it is, but Jonathan Swift, the previous guy who took 10 months to write two pages and yeah. refused the, the appeal, uh, he had also previously acted for British intelligence and 
uh, in an interview we found, he'd said that British intelligence were his favourite clients because they prepared their evidence really well mm -hmm. and stuff. So this is what Assange is up against. <laughs> and a clear, like, from, I've actually talked to people who are not involved in the case and who are not really political in any sense and said, like, how, what's the sort of threshold for conflict of interest where you have to recuse yourself? And they said it's low. If there's any hint that you have had some background that might influence your decision, you, you remove yourself. Yeah. And in fact, that's what happened with Lady Arbuthnot, um, uh, which Mohammed mentioned earlier. We did a series of stories. This is, sorry, I'll just give some context. This was a judge that made two key rulings against Assange in 2018 when he was still in the embassy. But it, if she'd ruled in his favour, it would have given him uh, a chance of safe passage to Ecuador, as the UK was obligated to do, but never did. Anyway, she ruled against him. Her husband uh, is a, t a Tory lord and former defence minister. Um, affiliate uh, on the board of various arms companies and stuff. Um, he's, he, um, she was actually personally funded by the Foreign Office, the British Foreign Office in 2014. They paid for her to go on a trip with her husband. Um, so, and we published a, a, like about six or seven, we went a bit mad and published about six or seven stories just detailing it all. And then she had, to, as Mohammed said, she, we don't know if it was because of those articles, but she withdrew from the case. Um, so, uh, and that, that's, as I say, like, we're small and we're alternative media. If The Guardian or anyone else was doing this stuff, he would 100% not be in Belmarsh. 100%. I, I interviewed yeah. Stella a couple of years ago and she said that to me. She, I asked her about the mainstream media and she said, if the mainstream media had mobilised in favour of Assange uh, and revealed the irregularities, the conflicts of interest, there's no way he would still be there because the case is... None of these wars that he exposed would happen. Exactly. Either. They are you know, complicit, they, man. They, all and, they, and that is their role. That's yeah. what you, under, you, yeah. you understand now. They are, they are mainly performing... And that's also why they hate him so much because he exposed them. Yeah. He exposed yeah. their real role. Um, so the, the, the judges today are a continuation of that trend. Um, I, as I say, I was a bit... They weren't quite as dismissive, but they're, they're smart people. That might be a PR strategy on their part. But... Um, uh, as I, uh, as you mentioned, Dustin, I think that that was a really important point that I noticed exactly what you were saying as well, that the judge, the British judges, sorry, the, you, the Assange defence lawyers seem to appe be appealing to um, the fact that they were going to get their asses handed to them in at the ECHR, mm -hmm. um, which I think they probably would because yeah. the case is so thin. But I have to say, the story I did this week was about a... A, uh, a UK citizen called Beba Ahmad, who was who was extradited to the United States in 2012. He was actually extradited in the batch with Abu Hamza, um, and he was in prison with Abu Hamza, uh, a prison called Long Latin up, up north. And uh, his description of uh, the conditions that uh, well, he firstly said to me that one day in the US prisons was is like a hundred days in Belmarsh. He was like, it's totally different ball game. He was taken there um, after five years. The, he, he, uh, the European Court took five years to to look at his case and then uh, okay the extradition. He was taken there and then put straight into solitary confinement. He said he went there, and met with the medic, and he noticed the medic have a little wink with the person who was the prison guard, and he realised that they basically put him on suicide watch, even though he was perfectly fine. He said it was just like they they were laughing about it, this kind of thing, and he was in solitary confinement for two years. He said that he the only conversations he had were out of the uh, sort of like hole in the the the, the door uh, with other people who were shouting into the atrium. And I said to him, how do you survive that? How do you survive? No, this is and really he, and, primitive and barbaric. Yeah, and I, he, well, he said, firstly, he said, what they're going to do to Assange will be worse. And then I said, he said, he said that the only way he survived it was his religion, Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, but he said it, he said a lot of people don't survive. He said, I had some, I had many sleepless nights of people just screaming nonstop. And the, um, uh, but he was, he, he, the, state, the rule 39 that he mentioned and, is a possibility for Assange. Again, in this case, as we've outlined tonight, they can not abide, there's no precedent for them not abiding by a Rule 39 from the European Court, but... Any, anything goes. You know, anything goes, in this, exactly. I, and they I, can I get him out of the jurisdiction. Like, there was one case in 2014 where a Belgian terrorist was um, drugged and put on a plane yeah. without even telling his lawyers. Uh, and then the Rule 39 was issued when he was out of the jurisdiction, so they could totally do that. They could just... Because he was explaining to me that what happens is if the appeal... If the ruling goes against Assange, then it's literally as every day as they go on the website of the European Court and uh, just do a submission for a Rule 39. 
and then it can take a couple of days. So the British government can just get him out, and also, and they they take their orders from the CIA anyway. So mm, yeah. they got a plane, they get a plane at RAF Mildenhall, which is where Beba Ahmed go and just get him out of the country. Yeah. So um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, I think I think there there will be. A, I'm not going to say a lot, but significant political backlash if they do that. But yeah. they would risk doing it anyway mm. for the Americans. That that's you know, that's what I it, think. It's yeah. definitely a possibility. Uh, yeah.